And with your spirit. Jesus and the disciples got into a boat and went off to a deserted place. But many people hurried there before them, so that as Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a des deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But Jesus answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass so that they sat, up, sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the, lo the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Rediscovering or rekindling a uh, kind of an amazement for the Eucharist. And so I'd like to, this evening to do a little, uh, just a reflection on, on spirituality of adoration <coughs> as a part of that amazement that we need to do. <coughs> and so if we think about spirituality or adoration, we need to remember that adoration uh, takes place uh, lots of times just within the church and the tabernacle. Uh, and adoration is different than exposition. Exposition happens when the Blessed Sacrament is taken out and put in a monstrance, and then there are all kinds of things that the Church uh, asks us to do in order to protect the presence of the Lord when we have uh, exposition. And so a, a, a theology or a spirituality of, of, of uh, adoration uh, contains at least three uh, things that I'd like to reflect on this evening. First of all, uh, the spirituality is the fact that the, first, uh, the spirituality of adoration is the fact that it is connected to the Eucharist. In his encyclical on the Eucharist, Pope John Paul II emphasizes that worship outside the Eucharist is strictly linked to the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice. The ritual for that uh, oversees um, adoration and exposition of the Blessed Sacrament ritual from 1973, worship of the Eucharist outside of Mass, also emphasizes the same teaching. It says, when the faithful adore Christ present in the Eucharist, they should remember that this presence derives from the sacrifice and has as its purpose both sacramental and spiritual communion. This, teaches, this teaching then reminds us that prayer before the Lord, before Christ the Lord, sacramentally present, extends the union with Christ that the faithful have reached in communion. It renews our commitment with the Lord and moves us to maintain, by the way we live, what we have received through the Eucharist. We strive to lead our lives, our whole lives, in the strength of this heavenly food. And so as we listen to this gospel this evening, we realize that this, this gospel does not proclaim Jesus as a static object or identify our prayer as an isolated event. The reading speaks of eating and drinking, of the many becoming one, of healing, of mercy, of transformation. 
we are returned to the central, essential expression of our faith, the Eucharistic liturgy. For it is in and through the eating and drinking that we understand that we are as those who need healing and are called to heal, as those who need mercy shown to us, and as those who must show mercy, and as those who are transformed, and those who are called to transform not just ourselves and our communities, but our very world. And so this connection between uh, adoration and Eucharist uh, has a couple of impl implications. First of all, the, the practice of, of uh, adoration before the Blessed Sacrament usually should follow Mass. So unusually, uh, unless there's a holy hour perhaps, or 40 hours or something, uh, would, would happen before Mass, but normally uh, a Eucharistic devotion happens after Mass. And so there's an essential connection between the Eucharist and what happens in, in the Holy Hour. And secondly, the, and what, it, what we use in the monstrance then, the, the, um, the host in the monstrance comes from the Eucharist. It's not coming from the tabernacle, generally speaking. It's not coming from the tabernacle. It should be coming, flowing directly from the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And so that practice then reminds us that for a spirituality of adoration, we need to have a real connection between adoration and the Eucharist. The second aspect of a spirituality of adoration is that it must be directly, directed towards communion. We become one at Mass, and we continue to become one in adoration. The ultimate intent of celebrating Eucharist is not to produce the sacred species for purposes of reservation and adoration, but to create the united body of Christ, which is the Church. The body of Christ is not only on the table, but is at the table and around the table. We are constantly linked back to the Eucharistic table and the call to live the communion as the body of Christ. Therefore, the elements of the Eucharist that lead to communion are also found in adoration. And so therefore, there's a gathering of the Lord's disciples to give thanks and praise. There is a listening of the, to the Word of God with an invitation to, to respond. There's an invitation to the community to worship as a gathering of the baptized. There's a formation of a community-oriented focus through hymns and psalms and intercessions. And so in other words, there's a liturgy that is connected to uh, a holy hour. A holy hour is not just exposing the Blessed Sacrament and then waiting for benediction. A holy hour it involves some kind of a liturgy. And so the, the Church really asks us to make it a liturgy. Communion is the activity that draws the church together as the body of Christ and reveals the nature of the church as a body that bears responsibility for the world. A key point here is the identification of Eucharist as an activity or as an action. For indeed, that is what the Eucharist is and what communion is strongly uh, exemplifies. Eucharistic devotions open us to the gift we receive in communion. How do we identify ourselves as a Eucharistic people? Through communion. Through communion, we express ourselves as communion, as a common union of persons with Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit for the healing of the world. We are koinonia, a relational body formed in the image of the triune God. We need to view the tabernacle not as a sign of passivity, but a sign of entering into the presence of God and coming into communion with the Word made flesh. The third aspect of the spirituality of adoration is the, is the need to grow in our hungering for the Eucharist. Our contemporary church often raises questions about practices of adoration 
or about their impact on individuals or communities or about the theology that underlies certain practices. But perhaps we should be asking other questions, not of the devotions themselves, but rather of our Eucharistic liturgies. These devotions have as their purpose to return people to the liturgy, hungry not to see the body of Christ, but to be the body of Christ. What must occur in our liturgies to make this connection stronger, <coughs> more present to those who celebrate? As well, we need to carefully avoid anything which might somehow obscure the principal desire of Christ in instituting the Eucharist, namely, to be with us as food, medicine, and comfort. Sometimes our understanding of adoration is incomplete. We focus on only on the first transformation of the Eucharist, the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. We sometimes are like the people in Paul's chorus, who did not recognize the second transformation, the transformation of the Christians into the body of Christ. This second transformation is the purpose of the first. Jesus becomes really present in the Eucharist so that we may really become his body. Our adoration must long for the fulfillment of the words of the third Eucharistic prayer. Grant that we who are nourished by his body and blood may be filled with his Holy Spirit and become one body, one spirit in Christ. The church is not merely a celebration, or the Eucharist is not merely a celebration of real presence, but a celebration of real presence which brings about unity and reconciliation in the whole body. As the early Christians sang at Eucharist, as many grapes are brought together and crushed to make the wine, as many grains of wheat are ground into flour to make the one bread, so we, although many, become one body when we eat the one bread. So as we continue with our, our time of adoration, uh, let's allow the Lord to continue to form our hearts and our minds uh, so that we may uh, really uh, enkindle a, a, a great amazement for the Eucharist and the gift that we have. And perhaps we can uh, conclude this reflection by singing the bread of life, number three or six, five ninety-seven. Five, five ninety-seven.